House fire, a fascinating but dangerous event. As the fabric of the building is consumed, the smoke we see is actually composed of hydrocarbons evaporating from the building materials. Materials like wood, paint and furniture. Fire also requires another element to fuel the flames, oxygen. Oxygen is the most reactive gas in air and fire thrives on it. Humans also need oxygen to survive. Most people who are killed in fires die from inhaling toxic fumes, not from burns. People cannot breathe in these dark, smoke-filled conditions. Firemen must use protective breathing apparatus to stop them inhaling the smoke, allowing them to rescue the survivors. The unfortunate victims suffer from the presence of toxic fumes in their lungs. These fumes are gases that cannot be used for respiration. Medics ready? Yeah. How people recover from the effects of smoke inhalation shows just how vital oxygen is to life. How we obtain and use oxygen to live is the subject of this episode of The Virtual Body. humans require oxygen to exist. But just why is oxygen so important? Well, in order to function, our bodies, and more specifically our cells, require oxygen for respiration. So just what is respiration? This is Jenna Coyne. Jenna is 19 and a Great Britain team swimmer. Her body works and trains in an unusual environment for a human being, water. Her body requires oxygen for respiration, but she cannot get it from the water around her. If Jenna can't use the oxygen in water, how does she acquire the oxygen she needs? Energy is the fuel of life. We acquire this energy from the breakdown of food. Just like the fire used oxygen to release energy from the building materials, so we need oxygen to release energy from our food. Like most animals, we have a respiratory system that allows us to extract the oxygen from the air around us efficiently. Hence Jenna, our swimmer, has to keep coming to the surface for air. When we breathe in, we extract oxygen from the air. We add carbon dioxide, a waste product of respiration, to the air that we breathe out. Together, this filling and emptying of our lungs is called ventilation. Breathing is an automatic response, which has its own basic rhythm. We breathe without having to think about it. Special nerve centres in the brain make it happen, even when we sleep. As a young baby, you already have this automatic response programmed into your system. As Jenna goes through her training, how does the oxygen get from her lungs and into her working cells, cells even at the extreme parts of her body? Somehow, the oxygen has to pass from Jenna's nose and mouth to all parts of her body where cell respiration takes place. As she trains, her body relies on several physiological systems working together. Let's examine what's happening to Jenna's body as she goes through her training. As Jenna surfaces, she inhales, taking air into her lungs. We can see small bubbles of gas being expelled as she exhales. Jenna has to repeat this rhythm all the time she's swimming, but there's a lot more going on inside her body. So before we closely examine the workings of the heart and lungs, let's look at the extent of our circulation system and how some of our internal systems work together. The oxygen is carried in our blood, which in turn flows throughout the body in our circulatory system. It's a bit like our own road network. The organ responsible for keeping the blood flowing is the heart. In fact, its sole purpose is to keep the blood flowing around the body. The rest of the circulatory system consists of hollow tubes called blood vessels. Our bodies appear very complicated, but the intricate design makes more sense if you think of it as a series of systems, each with its own tasks to do. 
remove the skin and the muscles, and the skeletal system is revealed. Our bodies are complicated because the systems are all interlinked and interdependent. Extending deep into our body are the air passages, the trachea and bronchi, which connect our mouth, nose and pharynx or throat to the lungs. With the help of the rib cage and diaphragm, they form the main organs of respiration. So how do our lungs work in supplying the oxygen we need? Well, the respiratory centre in the brain controls the movement of special muscles attached to our rib cage and diaphragm. When we need oxygen, these muscles are made to contract, which lifts the rib cage upwards. Notice how the diaphragm flattens. The combined effect of this movement is to increase the volume of the chest cavity, which in turn lowers the pressure inside the lungs. Do you remember Boyle's law? The pressure of a given quantity of gas varies inversely with its volume at a constant temperature. In other words, as the volume goes up, the pressure comes down and vice versa. So in this case, the atmospheric pressure outside is now slightly greater than the pressure inside the lungs. So the air rushes in through the nose and mouth, expanding the lungs in the process. Exhaling is just the reverse. Can you work out and describe how this will happen? Let's watch our virtual body as she breathes out. Can you see what's happening? Breathing out just reverses the action. The muscles relax, and so, assisted by the natural elastic recoil of the lungs, the volume of the chest cavity decreases, and the air is forced out. In a healthy individual, about 3% of the body's total energy needs is used for breathing, but this can increase to more than 30% in the case of an individual with lung disease. Smoking is a major contributing factor to lung and heart disease, it's responsible for over 100,000 deaths each year in the UK alone. Cigarette smoke contains three substances that have a direct effect on the lungs. Nicotine, carbon monoxide and tar. Nicotine is a highly addictive poison. It has a powerful effect on our nervous system. Carbon monoxide blocks the uptake of oxygen and tar destroys the lung surface, dramatically reducing the surface area available for gas exchange. Smoking may seem cool and trendy to some of our friends, but it seriously restricts airflow into and out of the lungs. Let's go inside the body. A person will normally breathe in and out about 500 millilitres of air, and that's about a pint, between 12 and 17 times a minute. If the demand for oxygen increases, as in exercise, the rate and volume increase automatically. So how is breathing controlled? Well, the rate and depth of breathing can be modified consciously, but only up to a point. The underlying need to breathe is automatic. We breathe without having to think about it. And it's all down to this part of the brain. This is the brain stem, and it's got a region called the medulla oblongata, responsible for controlling all our automatic nervous responses, including breathing. It's an intricate network of nerve cells, a Clapham junction of nerve cells, all connected together to send and receive messages all over the body. Some of these nerve cells group to form specialised centres, the signal boxes, if you like, and these are termed the respiratory centres. We've all experienced the panic sensation when we feel our lungs are empty of air. And it's our respiratory centres which detect changes in the levels of carbon dioxide in the blood passing by. The carbon dioxide must be removed. So signals are fired off along nerves to make the muscles of the rib cage work faster. Our young boy, Jan, has to surface as quickly as possible to gasp for air and replenish his supply of oxygen. In this endoscopic footage, we can see that air from the mouth and nose passes through the voice box. It then descends along the windpipe, or trachea, towards the lungs. The trachea is kept open by rings of cartilage in its wall, and once in the chest, it divides into two branches, called bronchi. The bronchi lead directly to each lung. Once inside the lungs, the air travels down a series of branch-like tubes called bronchioles. The bronchioles get narrower and narrower towards their ends and eventually finish in bunches of tiny air sacs, the alveoli. 
The alveoli are elastic, thin-walled structures, and we have approximately 150 million of them in each lung. That's a lot of air sacs, giving us a lot of surface area. The alveoli are enmeshed in a network of blood capillaries, and it's here that the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide takes place. The oxygen and carbon dioxide pass through by simple diffusion. Oxygen in high concentration diffuses across the thin membrane of each alveolus into the blood. Carbon dioxide travels in the opposite direction, so it leaves the blood and enters the lungs. The inner surface of each alveolus is covered by a thin layer of water in which the gases dissolve before they diffuse through. But they also contain another fluid called surfactant. Why is this fluid so important? Well, remember, the alveoli are very thin, wet sacs and they have a natural tendency to collapse inwards, blocking diffusion. Without surfactant, it would be very difficult to produce enough pressure to inflate the lungs. We've already seen Jan sitting under the water in the pool. But how long can he manage to stay underwater? Well, this depends on how long he can hold his breath. If we tried to use water for respiration, we would soon discover that we couldn't remove the water that had entered our lungs. Surprisingly, the lungs have no muscles. They rely on elastic recoil to deflate in exhalation. Water is much heavier than air. It's too heavy for our pressure-dependent breathing system to remove efficiently. Let's run through the links again. Air flows down the trachea and into the lungs, where oxygen is picked up by the blood in the alveoli. The oxygen is carried in the blood to the cells and tissues where it's used for cell respiration. The blood is pumped around the body by the heart. Now, the heart has two systems. One system pumps the blood to and from the lungs, and the other system pumps the blood around the body. It keeps these two systems separate to maximise the efficiency of oxygen exchange. The right side of the heart deals with deoxygenated blood, while the left side deals with oxygenated blood. Blood from the lungs flows into the left atrium. Atrium just means entrance in Latin. The blood then flows into the left ventricle, which pumps it round the body. It's got a long way to travel, so it has to be sent on its way with a big force or high pressure. The left ventricle has thick muscular walls to give it the big push it needs. The same action happens on the right side of the heart with blood returning to the lungs. But the blood doesn't need high pressure to get back to the lungs, so the muscular wall is much thinner. So in the lungs, at the alveoli, the oxygen is picked up by the passing blood. But how does this actually happen? One drop of blood carries millions of these cells, the red blood cells. They have this distinctive shape, which gives them a large surface area to absorb oxygen, and no nucleus, so they have maximum room for the substance haemoglobin. Haemoglobin is a bright red pigment and gives blood its colour. It's a globular protein, with the metal iron at its centre. It's the presence of the iron that gives haemoglobin its oxygen binding and releasing properties. The haemoglobin is transported along the blood vessels within the red blood cells. So how does haemoglobin work? How does it know when to pick up oxygen and when to let it go? Well, in areas where oxygen concentrations are high, such as in the lungs, oxygen passes into the cells and binds loosely with haemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. In this state, it travels through the body until it reaches an area where oxygen concentrations are low, such as close to working cells. In the working tissues, the red blood cells let go of the oxygen and revert back to haemoglobin, ready to be used again. On average, an adult has five to six litres of blood in their body. The oxygenated blood leaves the heart via the aorta and is transported to the rest of the body's arteries. The high pressure from the beating of the heart forces the blood along quickly, so arteries have tough, elastic muscular walls to withstand this high pressure. Arteries connect to the venous system, or veins, via capillaries in the tissues. So the capillary network links the arterial circulation with the venous circulation. Blood flow in the capillaries, which are narrow, is slower to allow exchange of gases, nutrients and waste products. So what happens to the deoxygenated blood high in carbon dioxide? 
Well, it flows through the capillaries into the venous system, and in the veins, it's returned to the heart. By now, the pressure pushing the blood along is much less. Also, a lot of blood is travelling against gravity as it flows upwards from the legs. To make the flow easier, the veins are much wider than arteries, offering less resistance. The veins also contain valves to prevent the backflow of blood, so blood only overflows in one direction. The blood is returned to the heart via the main vein, the vena cava. The deoxygenated blood arrives in the right atrium, moves down to the ventricle, and is then carried in the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Because there are two circulations, one serving the lungs and one serving the rest of the body, the blood actually passes through the heart twice in every complete circuit of the body. The better or more efficiently our heart works, the more efficient or fitter our bodies become. As we exercise, our heart muscle is exercised, and so it becomes stronger. Back in the pool, as Jenna races against the clock, her muscles are working harder, using more oxygen and increasing the amount of carbon dioxide being produced. This must be removed before it poisons the tissues. The carbon dioxide is carried in both the water of the red blood cells and in the blood plasma. This process is exactly the same as the one occurring within Jan's body as he holds his breath sitting underwater. Even with an increase in breathing, we sometimes make such demands on our body that we cannot breathe fast enough to replace the oxygen being used by the muscles. But they still need energy, so they revert to releasing it without the aid of oxygen by anaerobic respiration. But the lactic acid waste produced must be removed quickly, and the body needs oxygen to do this. In fact, what Jenna has done is to take up oxygen on credit, when she stops exercising, this oxygen debt must be paid back. The pumping action of the heart, like the breathing process, requires energy. The heart beats about 70 times a minute, so why doesn't it get tired or cramp like your other muscles would? Well, the heart or cardiac muscles clearly have special properties that other skeletal muscles don't have. Cardiac muscle is made of short, interwoven branches of cells that spread the waves of muscle contractions. This allows the heart to contract or beat repeatedly without rest. When it contracts, technically known as its systole phase, the blood is pumped out of the heart into the arteries. The heart then relaxes its diastole phase and blood flows into the heart from the veins. So the blood only flows through the heart in one direction, and this is made possible by flap-like heart valves which prevent the blood from flowing backwards. So oxygen is vital to our survival. All our organs, tissues and cells could do nothing without it. Without oxygen, our cells would quickly die and without our circulatory system, we couldn't get the oxygen into our tissues or the waste products away from them. And Jan has found a more successful way of breathing underwater.